uh, we have Dr. David Waterman and uh, Ms. Muniza, Muniza Shamsi. David Waterman is a professor at La Rochelle in France, where he's the director of Applied Foreign Languages Department and a member of the Center for Research in International and Atlantic History. He has a number of published titles to his credit and has served on the editorial uh, team of Pakistan Yath and is currently working on Pakistani history, culture and literature in English. And this is a book launch. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize that. And uh, we are having this book launch today, Where Worlds Collide. And uh, the speaker is Muniza Shamsi, who is an author of a number of books on literature. And uh, also uh, the bibliographer of the, for the Journal of Commonwealth Literature on the editorial board of Pakistaniyat and uh, also on the International Advisory Board of the Journal of Postcolonial Writing and on the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. She was a jury member in 2013. Muniza Shamsi really needs, does not need much of an introduction in terms of literature in Pakistan because she's a well-known name and uh, the moderator who will be joining us is uh, Dr. Framji Minwala. He's the chair of the Department of Social Sciences and Liberal Arts at IBA Karachi. He has also taught at numerous institutions including Yale, Vassar, Dartmouth and the George Washington University in the United States as well as Zabist and Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture. His essays and reviews, uh, he's the author of a number of them and is currently working on a book, uh, the working title of which is Writing Theatre's Histories. He'll be joining us in a while, so I will ask uh, Muniza Shamsi to please uh, begin. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Is this working? Yes. It, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. David Waterman. Um, and Framji, will, he's actually stuck in traffic, so um, he will be joining us. He asked me to go ahead and um, uh, do the introduction for him. I actually um, came across Dr. Uh, Waterman. We, we sort of um, became acquainted by chance almost because he used to write for this um, Journal of Pakistan Studies, Pakistani Art, and he was the reviews editor there. And then um, last year he order, organized a conference at the University of La Rochelle which uh, I attended and um, he has actually very close association with a number of universities in Pakistan. He supervises PhDs and um, he's lectured at uh, um, Rawalpindi and Islamabad and I think now he's going to Bhalpur, he's going to Lahore and he's come to Karachi. So, and he's written this book, Where Worlds Collide, um, Pakistani fiction in the new millennium. Um, I'm going to actually ask him why he got involved in Pakistani writing and why he wrote this book. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, how did I get involved in, in Pakistani writing? Uh, well, first of all, I, I need to thank you all for coming and thank the organizers. Um, uh, as an academic, I'm not used to people making a fuss over anything I've written. Uh, and believe me, I'm not going to get a big head. I'm not going to quit my day job or anything like that. Uh, but I want to thank you and especially thank uh, Muniza for... Uh, if, if you know Muniza, you know everybody. Uh, you're, you're part of the network then, then because she knows everybody and everybody knows her. So, and she would very kindly wrote the, the foreword for the book. Uh, I was trained in uh, social psychology uh, in, in the beginning. Uh, questions of identity, uh, social identity in interests me a lot. And I've always been fascinated with South Asia generally, you know, and questions of how do you govern a, a place like South Asia, which is so incredibly diverse. I've always been fascinated by, uh, by that, and uh, I was trained in the traditional British literature canon uh, in the United States, uh, and then with a focus on post-colonial theory. And as I was finishing up a project on Pat Barker about seven years ago, I was sort of fell into a few novels uh, uh, about Pakistan, 
and realized that this was great stuff. You know, that's a technical academic literary term, great stuff. Uh, and nobody in France was really dealing with it, you know. In the US, they were dealing with it. In the UK, they were dealing with it in the universities and, and making it a, a, an object of study. Um, but nobody in France was touching it, and I thought, well, here's my chance, my opportunity to maybe make a, at least a little bit of an original contribution to, to the study of uh, Pakistani literature. And I suppose it's normal that it comes a little bit later to France, because France not being an Anglophone country, in spite of my efforts. Um, you know, and so that's uh, sort of how I, I came into it, and one thing led to another. Next thing you know, I was kind of part of the network, and people were asking me to collaborate in various projects. And, it's like a snowball rolling downhill, and I think it's going to keep me busy for the rest of my natural life, anyway. Uh, could you tell us something about the authors that you chose for this book and why? Um, basically, it's a book which deals with um, with um, nine novels, and um, it's actually the it's actually the first book that I know of that. Um, focuses entire chapter on novels. There's not been too much, you know, because when a work is new, there's not, the academic work on it sort of comes later. So there are actually very few books on Pakistani English literature. And um, they usually come within um, a context of the Muslim diaspora and one or two novels. There, there are a couple of books that have been written, you know, on identities and so on. But this is the first one that I've come across which uh, devotes an entire chapter to a specific novel. And it's very accessible. I think that was one of the po uh, points of doing this. Um, the, the writers that he has got are Nadeem Aslam, Uzma Aslam Khan, Mohsin Hamid, Muhammad Hanif, Surya Khan, H.M. Naqvi, and Kamla Shamsi. Can you, can you tell us why you chose these and why you chose the specific books and what they offered? Well, uh, I look at... Um literature but not from a literary angle you know I'm more of a I'm more interested in social critique uh, which means that when when I get the chance to speak to some of these writers they usually don't like me very well because the writers they want to talk about art their art and I never want to talk about art uh, I, I want to talk about social mess you know the political message uh, the social critique what this book what this work not necessarily a book uh, a text has to say uh, about our society and, and uh, what we can do to, to make it better. Um, not that I'm against art, it's just that I'm too thick to understand art. Uh, and so I, I just avoid talking about it and stick with what I, what I do know about. Um, and it seemed to me that uh, much of contemporary Pakistani fiction in English is really historical fiction, uh, very much informed by, by current events. Uh, all of the, the authors in the novel, uh, in, the, in the book, are... Uh, you know, the, the sort of the second wave of, of Pakistani uh, novelists in, in English and who are very much concerned not only with those big, um, big issues, or, you know, the, the things that we see in the papers every day, but they're, what interests me is that they're also concerned with those everyday issues, things like uh, poverty and education and health care uh, and, and those kinds of things which... Uh, interest me as well and which we don't hear so much about in the West you know that you know the things we hear about uh, about Pakistan in the West right? uh, the, all of the uh, the negative things whereas, uh, you know to Mosan Amid uh, says that you know we, we don't have to make any excuses uh, uh, for Pakistan anymore it's not just an idea it's uh, it's a real country now not just an, an idea and we don't have to make excuses or apologize to anybody or justify uh, the fact that Pakistan exists so let's get on with it um, and so that's, uh, I guess, the reason that, uh, that I'm interested in these particular writers. What do they, what their specific novels have to offer? What the specific novels that you've chosen on, could we yeah. sort of look at the, you know, you, you begin with the reluctant fundamentalist and then... Yeah. Um, uh, there are a lot, lot of things that, you know, you, you discover, uh, you talk about the divides within society between politics and us and them. And I thought if you could t tell us, you know, about the specific books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that nobody has read the book yet. I don't have a copy yet myself, so I'm assuming you haven't read it either, yeah? 
Uh, th there are copies over there, but I, I don't have one. Uh, so, they, but they are available. Uh, I, I start with Mosan uh, Amid's uh, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, uh, which I examine through the, the lens of personal and political identity in that gray area between what we might call the essential self or what Corinna Beyer calls the primary self and identity as a social production. Now, I've already told you I'm interested in social psychology, right? And so I'm interested in identity as a social production uh, requiring contact with the other uh, in order to bring me into existence. Okay, so you can see I'm not approaching from a terribly literary perspective. And then I move to uh, uh, Kamala Shamsi's In the City by the Sea as representative of the Karachi novels in several senses where the city becomes uh, the hub of family life which mirrors the life of the nation through time. And that's one of the threads that runs through my book is that the family in Pakistani fiction is, is basically a metaphor for the nation or the, the, the community writ large, right? Uh, and the idea that the city or the contact zone, if you will, is inseparable from our personal and national destiny. Those are Richard Lehan's words. And then I, I stay with, uh, with Shamsi's uh, cartography. Uh, the protagonists, there are young people too, uh, who were born after partition, after the 1971 war, uh, yet living with the consequences of that historical inheritance, wherein the trauma of war spills over into the domestic sphere, as it always does, right, even a generation later, manifested through immigration and what Moira Fradinger calls citizenship anxiety and the resulting realignment of political uh, allegiances. Uh, even if you don't move, the map can, and you can suddenly find yourself in enemy territory. Uh, and then I move on to uh, Nadim Aslam's uh, The Wasted Vigil, once again as a contact zone uh, between people of many different origins, much like Karachi, uh, but here in the context of contemporary Afghanistan. Uh, and in Aslam's novel, identity is policed by the dominant competing powers, whether by Taliban warlords or the CIA, uh, neither of whom is terribly open to ideas of hybrid identity. Uh, and the image of what we're left with in that novel, of course, is what Nadia Butt calls a fragmented mosaic of interconnected places, much as we'd seen in In the City by the Sea. And then I stay with uh, uh, Aslam, uh, Maps for Lost Lovers, where he confronts the uh, clash of civilizations so frequently invoked, whereas the sentiment for the immigrants in the novel is not so much of clash, but of vulnerability. And of course, the clash formula, as you know, is just too simple, too Manichaean to account for the complexities of, the, of that formula. And ultimately, that family, is, if you've read the, the novel, is torn apart because the mother, she seems preoccupied with the past, and the father is too concerned about the future, and nobody seems to be worrying too much uh, about the present. Uh, which, uh, you know, if, if the, one of the central theses of, of my book is that the family is a metaphor for the nation, uh, this family is not doing, not doing well. Then uh, the, the attacks of September 11th are at the center of H.M. Uh, Nagfi's homeboy, wherein three metrostanis who were well integrated into New York society find themselves suddenly divested of membership, much like uh, Hamid's Changes. In times of crisis, the criteria for defining constituency become much more exclusive through what Fradinger calls a zone of exception, wherein the law is legally changed and allows you to put people in prison uh, without charging them with a crime, right? It's essentially making a, a scapegoat uh, without the accompanying burden of proof, which should, in, in any decent justice system, uh, be required, right? You've all seen this when what we call the perp walk, when the police march the perpetrator, you know, in front of the cameras going to the squad car, right? And even before there's been an investigation, there's already been a court of public opinion, right? Sort of a, sacri a sacrifice to the court of public opinion, if you will, without any obligation to prove uh, what you're alleging. Um, and then Hanif's novel, uh, in keeping in line with the, the idea of historical fiction, uh, Hanif's novel, A Case of Exploding Mangoes, which is actually the very first uh, that I'd read and what got me into Pakistani fiction. Uh, probably the best example for historical fiction. Uh, severe critique of Zia al uh, presidency, Hanif's story that might be true, 
fills in the gaps in the historical record regarding Zia's death in that plane crash. And of course, Exploding Mangoes is a work of fiction. There's no doubt about that. But it proposes one possible scenario out of many other possible worlds, evolving into what Horst Steinmetz calls something more than history without becoming false. And what's nice about historical fiction is that it's a gray area. You can do things that a, a, an historian could not do and still be considered credible. For example, you can uh, have greater latitude to address morality and ethics. You can foreground minor characters. You can psychologize historical figures. Uh, and yet remain coherent with the reader's expectations of what, a, uh, what such a possible world could or should be like. The next to last, uh, no, not next to last, uh, eight is The Geometry of God, Usma Aslam Khan's novel, which I really like because it is representative of the nuances which oblige one to reject those simple binary oppositions that we fall into so often. The characters, as you know, the main characters are paleontologists, quite literally digging into the past, seeking not so much to answer questions about fossils in themselves, um, but what the pre-Islamic past has to say about current Pakistani cultural identity. And when you talk about geological time, you're talking about a very long time. Uh, yet societies experience what Michael O'Reilly has called culture quakes which disrupted the dominant order and its certitudes. And you know as well as I do that Pakistan and South Asia generally has gone through several culture quakes in contemporary times. Uh, and then I look at that chapter, at that work um, through Navida Khan's concept of Muslim becoming as well, a useful lens which sort of allows you to look at how history and the notion of origins uh, and, and then of the nation are to be represented and constructed along this obstacle-filled terrain. The next to last chapter then is the story of a single family and its lingering traumatic memories from the 1971 war, a uh, family's haunting which reflects the national scale of collective inherited trauma recalled and revisited through the little girl who wasn't yet born and yet has the uncanny ability to force others' recollections. You know, of course, I'm talking about Noor, uh, Soraya Khan's novel of the same name. Uh, and Noor is, a, uh, she's a genuine visionary, and her precocious artwork serves to link past with present, and she is, in effect, translating her mother's and grandfather's memories of the war from one form into another, from one time and place into another, and ultimately becomes the family's healer by obliging them to give voice and narrative structure, what Rene Caes calls a place of inscription, to the memories that they thought they'd so neatly filed away. And then the final chapter of the work is, is nonfiction. Uh, I used it as sort of a coda because, as you know, many of these uh, novelists are also uh, journalists. They write for, for the papers, uh, they, they do social critique in their columns, and so the, the coda for the, for the book uh, takes a look at Shamsi's offense, the Muslim case, uh, because it talks about many, many of the same issues that, that the, the fictional representations do. And I thought it was a good way to tie up the, the whole idea uh, of historical fiction, right? And the questions of, uh, of Islam and, and the role of Islam in, uh, in Pakistan uh, from, uh, from the beginnings in, in 1946, well, the beginnings of, as Pakistan in 1947, uh, and its uh, use uh, as, as a political tool as well. Uh, and all of the critiques that, uh, that go along with, with that. So that just gives you a quick idea of the book. Framji, hi. Hi, David. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies for being late. I'm That's well. okay. Um, I have a question. Um, okay. So one of the things you talk about in the book, in addition to um, uh, historical fiction and the construction of alternative histories, yeah. is also the construction of alternative identities. Um, could you talk about how those two might be connected, especially with your thesis about Pakistan as a nation in the process of becoming, as opposed to a nation that is? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, th I, I think. Uh, my, my interest in identity is, is, uh, is very socially constructed and, and Pakistani contemporary history has, has been accelerated really 
it's, it's like time has, it has been compressed and, and Pakistan has gone through so many of those culture quakes and several wars uh, in, uh, in the past uh, couple of generations, which, you know, in geological time is nothing, you know, two generations. And, uh, and so it seems to me that, uh, that those questions of identity are moving along in that same accelerated time warp that, that accompany the historical time warp. Uh, and even uh, the, the question of identity is, is so complicated. On my way here, I had to stop in uh, Istanbul and then Istanbul to Karachi. And as we're filling out the papers, you know, for the airport, I noticed that most of the Pakistanis, just like me, have two passports, you know. And, and so you have to add that factor in as well, uh, that, uh, that the Pakistani diaspora around the planet is enormous, right? Uh, and yet they maintain uh, these strong roots and attachments uh, to Pakistan, not to mention the fact that, uh, you know, it's entirely possible that some pa a group of Pakistanis could be in the same room together and not necessarily speak the same uh, language, right? Um, uh, and so I, I, th I think that uh, that's what interests me too, is that it's an interest, for somebody who's interested in social psychology, uh, it, it's such an interesting laboratory because so much is happening so quickly in terms of identity evolution. And of course, you know, the founder of Pakistan, Jinnah, is, is very often invoked. Uh, but as I mentioned in, in the introduction, uh, the, there comes a time maybe when it's, it's time to say, well, okay, well, that's maybe what Jinnah might have wanted, but maybe it's time to just let the current generation of, uh, generations of Pakistanis decide. What, what Pakistan is, is to become. And that's exactly what's happening. You know, that's exactly what you, we're doing. Uh, there's a great deal of debate and discussion and disagreement about how that should happen, but that's only normal. Uh, so. Maybe there's a question for you. Um, you have also written extensively about Pakistani fiction and uh, fiction writers for many, many years now. Um, uh, could you talk about uh, the foreword that you wrote for David's book and um, your sense of uh, the importance of continued uh, a interpretation, criticism, thinking about Pakistani fiction? Well, um, I, I was uh, writing this foreword. What I, I'll tell you what I liked about the book. I had mentioned this earlier was that I found it was, um, gave this detailed analysis of each each book. Um, there were a lot of things that I, I found, um, but one of the things I liked about it was that it, um, it didn't divide um, the books into, you know, uh, most other books you get the 9-11 novel, the 7-7 seven, seven novel, the, uh, well, uh, um, you know, um, it, it was, it sort of formed kind of linkages between these novels. And I mean, the kind of things that I, I found fascinating was that he was discussing cartography, for example, of this multi-ethnic city. And he draws a parallel between this multi-ethnic city and this villa in Afghanistan in Nadeem Aslam's Wasted Vigil, where people of different nationalities converge. And I, I love the comment that they, because there's a Russian woman who turns up there and the villa is owned by an Englishman who was married to an Afghan. The Englishman is the son of a missionary. Then you get a American turned up who turns up to have been uh, the lover of this um, Englishman and his Afghan wives. And so actually what happens is that all these people are interconnected. It's a kind of, as he says, they're all a part of a tribe. And um, I, I, I really like this sense of, um, you know, of moving beyond uh, small, you have an identity, your community, and yet it's all interlinked. And this, um, because we, it's, it's not just that we live in a world of globalization, but actually the history of mankind is all about migration. It's all about interconnectedness. It's all about cultures that travel. And um, th that was something that really appealed to me. The other thing that I, I found really important was the inclusion of the novel Noor. It's, you know, when people, do, because of this um, whole sort of 9-11 thing, everybody tends to discuss those novels and the politics that, uh, of uh, Pakistan and the West. But Noor is a novel about the 1971 war. 
And in a way, it's linked to cartography because cartography also looks at ethnic divides. But cartography is set in Karachi. You know, you, you're seeing the war from this angle and the tensions. Noor actually takes you into that war. It is set in Bangladesh, into East Pakistan. And the story is about an army officer who adopts a Bengali orphan child in the middle of that war and he brings her home to Islamabad. She grows up as his child and she gets married and then her daughter Noor has these um, uncanny dreams and actually it turns out there's a horrific story of what happened to her parents and what happened to him in East Pakistan and that is a subject that we really do need to confront and we have not done so and this novel brings that in and it's a very important because we lost half a country we were redefined after 1971 and we don't really discuss it and to put that in the context of all these other novels about more contemporary issues I thought was really important and very significant and and the 1971 war is is a good example too of uh, of different interpretations. As someone like myself coming from outside, I, I have a tendency to call that war the, uh, the Pakistani Civil War. Uh, and most of the Pakistanis that I've met don't do that. Uh, they call it one of the Indo-Pak wars, which it was as well, right? And so it, it's just uh, different ways of, of interpreting what, what was going on in, in, uh, at that time. I don't know. Should we take a, a survey? Who considers the 1971 war to be a civil war, a Pakistani civil war? One, two, three. Oh, lots more okay, here. Okay, you see? So it's good that I extended my, uh, my, uh, my survey a bit. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I th one more question, and I think we open the floor to the audience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we all um, understand that uh, Pakistani writers, reading Pakistani writers of fiction is important, but why is it important to also read uh, criticism about that fiction? <laughs> who's, who, who's this question for? Both of you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think... I, I, I don't know if this is true. Uh, we, we'd have to ask the writers of, of, the, of the works. But, uh, I, I would like to think that, that in looking at these novels from other perspectives that, uh, that you may not have thought of, uh, for example, with, um, with Homeboy, I, I, I look through the lens of, of what uh, has been called binding violence, you know, uh, and this idea that societies are often held together by defining a common enemy. Uh, and that violence that binds us together and if if my modest uh, or you know me or any other scholar if the modest contribution that we could make uh, in writing books about books right uh, would be just to encourage people to look from from a different perspective and I suppose the way to know if if we've succeeded in doing that is to ask the writers themselves did you learn anything about your own w work by reading mine uh, did that change anything about your perspective, because after all, once you publish a book, uh, the reader can do basically whatever they like with it, right? Um, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I, I, I think if you, uh, I mean, the, the books have um, all kinds of uh, nuances and connotations. Sometimes I think then the author, I, well, I, I, I said the author doesn't know. I met, a, I met an elderly um, British author. She was about 90 by then, and she said, oh, she said, I met this young girl. She was writing about my novels, all sorts of things I'd never thought of, never even occurred to me. <laughs> and I thought, well, that, that's one way, but there are, there's a kind of um, tropes and things, this young woman, they're, they're, a novel is actually a very intricate and complex work. And I suppose maybe perhaps I, the best way is to quote the great George Steiner, who said words to the effect that a writer, when he's writing, he's inside the work, he writes the book. But we as critics looked at it from a distance. We kind of build an architecture around that work. Of course, that architecture keeps changing. So it's maybe I'm not sure whether architecture, which to me is something rather solid, um, because you know you you have different views. You know you have post-colonials and Commonwealth, and then everybody says no, that's all wrong, and, and all these definitions. But actually, I think by put, and I think that is very much needed. I think by putting a work within a wider framework is very important. You 
need to look at it in terms of history of, and also not only just your own history. I mean, how does this novel or this work relate to what is being written um, elsewhere? How are other people, and especially in Anglophone literature, which is a world literature, so you've got people from all over the world, and there's sort of lots of interesting parallels between what someone in Pakistan has written and with someone of a nation they hadn't even thought of, you know. Thank you. Um, questions from the floor? Is there a mic? Uh, let's say five minutes for yeah. the questions. Yeah, there's a question right there in the back. Yeah. Hello, hi. Um, hi. I'm standing up so you can see me sure. while I ask my question. Um, okay, I've been trying to form my question throughout your talk and I still haven't formed it, so I'm just going to blurt it out. Um, my question is um, really about the historical novel, since that seems to be your field of expertise. Um, and yeah, ex this expertise, is uh, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. I, I, I try not to. I try not to claim being uh, an expert in anything. That's safer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're more of an expert than I am. So, um, I actually this question is with regard to um, a case of exploding mangoes, mm -hmm. um, which you have uh, said is really a historical novel, right? Uh, you it, have termed historical it. fiction. Yes. Yes. Right. Well, it's got a. Um, it's fiction is mingled with history and right. actually that's where my question uh, comes from. Ever since I've read the book I have had um, this question has bothered me and um, I'm, this is a question about ethics actually and uh, because I, and I'm not asking this question because I have I think uh, uh, Muhammad Hanif is a absolutely amazing author. Yeah, and he's and here, so you have to be polite, right? Okay, okay. And um, this novel of his, his very first novel, took uh, Pakistan by storm. Uh, and even perhaps on a more modest scale, uh, the international community as well. Um, but my question is, that shouldn't ethics come into uh, such kind of writing? Because I know that when I, and I'm no fan of Zawal I just want to make that clear to everyone. Um, but even then, when I read the novel, um, the way I think about Ziaul Haq has changed forever. I mean, it's, I'm not going to, um, you know, I, I cannot get a picture of Ziaul Haq as I used to think of him as a political figure before I read this novel. Now all I can think of, um, however I think of Ziaul Haq has, you know, this novel comes in, in the way, um, the way that um, uh, Muhammad Hanif has um, portrayed, portrayed him, him and, yeah. you know, depicted him, his personality. Okay. Uh, um, shouldn't there be some, some kind of, I mean, doesn't it bother? Questions short. Sorry, I'm so, really sorry. Um, we're running out of time. Okay, sorry. Um, just, is it ethi ethical to do that? Well, uh, you know, if... If we were to get a group of 100, 100 historians together and we told them, here's your archive, you're historians, you're supposed to deal with the facts, right? That's what historians do. Uh, and we put 100 historians in a room with the archive and we said, okay, have a look at this archive and then write, write up what the archive is about, write, it, write about what happened. And do you know how many different stories we would get, how many different historians' reports? About 100. Um, because everybody's going to be, all these historians are going to be looking at that from, from a different, uh, different perspective. Uh, and I think in historical fiction, uh, I, I, I lean the other way. I think that the fiction part of it allows us to inject the kind of ethical and moral plane that we would like to would, uh, engage the reader with. Uh, and that's, I think, the liberty that when you're writing historical fiction, huh, that liberty uh, is actually a good thing. You're allowed to do that sort of thing without justifying it, whereas uh, an historian normally shouldn't. 
Um, and so I, I look at the ethical question kind of from the other side. I, uh, rather than uh, necessarily historical accuracy. Uh, the, the question comes up every now and then. Historians who work on the First World War uh, normally would never use Pat Barker's World War I trilogy as part of the archive. And yet there are certain historians now who are saying, hey, this is a, a fictional representation of the war which creates uh, an, an atmosphere of what we really think that war was like. And there are now some historians who would be willing to accept the idea that, that we could do that. And so I think there's a, a certain flexibility. And of course, it all depends on whether you agree with what the, the ethical perspective that the author has presented as well. If he's gone too far with you know, stretching the facts or changing things around a bit. Um, but of course, since it is a work of fiction, uh, there's no obligation to to do uh, to truth, really. We will have Another to question? There's on. one more question, excuse and then me, I think... Excuse Pilar. me, Mr. Huh? Brandy. Yeah, we, we don't have time. The others uh -huh. are waiting. We're already behind time. I'm so sorry. We started a bit late. And uh, just as a uh, hint for the next session, please keep your questions as questions and short ones. And if... So you still have you questions. I'm much. around for the next three days, so I mean, you know, we will have time to talk. Yes. David Manisa, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. David Waterman, Manisa Shamsi, and Pramji Minwala, and the audience, thank you. And over to Nusrat now for the next session.